and we try and teach them surfing as a way to instill these values of commitment towards long-term goals. Surfing being a really difficult skill to learn, that goes to figure that if you've learned surfing, you've also learned to appreciate that it takes a while to learn something meaningful and learn to appreciate the value of that. In Bitcoin land, we call that low time preference. Having followed Bitcoin Beach since, since its early days, we decided to try and do the same thing with our existing organization, which is to switch over from taking donations in fiat to taking donations in Bitcoin instead, and then using that Bitcoin to basically run the organization with the biggest expense being the salaries of the coaches who work on a daily basis and then onboard shops so that they can spend their salaries in Bitcoin. Your coaches are, are living on a Bitcoin standard. Pretty much, yeah. That is super amazing. It's not the size of the little circular economy that you try to build that matters. It's what matters is how many, how many others like that can you exp inspire to pop up? Like if you're, if you're building a circular economy and you've only got 10 shops and you've got, you know, three, four, maybe whatever. I mean, we've got, we've got five people who earn salaries full time and four part time and, you know, 10, 11 shops. It's, it's pretty small. But if we can inspire a hundred more like that, then that's significant. We are live here at Bitcoin Beach with none other than the founder of Bitcoin, Akasi, Erman. We're so glad to have you uh, join us here. It's been it's really a blast to be able to get to know you. First, we were in Argentina and now here. So welcome. Thank you. No, it's been a fantastic time. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great to see these things in real life. Thank you very much. So tell the audience, I, I think most people have by now heard about the project, but in case they haven't, tell them a little bit about Bitcoin Akasi, the, the long-term roots. I know this is not something new for you guys. You've been working in the community there for, I, I think, a decade now. Um, so tell us a little bit about the history and then more recently, some of the changes that have happened. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been about a decade, a little bit longer. We started in November 2010. We, um, we had the first small group of kids that um, came to the beach with us and um, the organization had its roots there. It's, it's been a formal organization since 2013, um, a registered nonprofit. And uh, we started working in the community where we are based now in 2015. And since 2016, it's been running on a daily basis, five days a week. Um, the organization is called the Surfer Kids, and essentially what we do is we take kids from a really poor area and we try and teach them surfing as a way to instill these values of commitment um, towards long-term goals. Surfing being a really difficult skill to learn, it goes to figure that if you've learned surfing, you've also learned to appreciate that it takes a while to learn something meaningful um, and learn to appreciate the value of that. Um, I think, I mean, in Bitcoin land, we call that low time preference, um, but it can be translated in many different ways. Um, and essentially what we did in, 2000, in 2021 is uh, after having followed Bitcoin Beach um, since, since its early days, we decided to try and do the same thing with our existing organization, which is to switch over from taking donations in fiat to taking donations in Bitcoin instead, and then using that Bitcoin to basically run the organization with the biggest expense being the salaries of the coaches who work on a daily basis and then onboard shops so that they can spend their salaries in Bitcoin. So your coaches are, are living on a Bitcoin standard? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> That is super amazing to, to see They're They're probably more proper Bitcoiners than, you know, the, the people who have been going to conferences for the last 10 years. They're actually living on a day to day basis. Yeah, I mean, they've they've been using Bitcoin on a daily basis for a year and a half. 
and uh, they earn 100% of their salaries in Bitcoin. From time to time, if, if we have to, you know, we'll throw some fiat in there. Uh, but the idea is to pay them 100% in Bitcoin. Uh, the last couple of weeks while I've been away traveling, I've had to pay them in fiat. Um, but 99% uh, of the time, their salaries have been paid in Bitcoin. And they use it to buy groceries and just about everything they need. They only cash out if they really have to. There are some things which obviously they can't pay in Bitcoin. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yet, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so tell us, um, kind of what the now what the program focuses around. I know surfing is is a part of it, but I think you guys have some educational components. Um, I think there's more recently a lifeguard program that you guys have started. So, kind of give people the breadth of what you guys are doing there. Yeah, uh, the core of the program is still surfing. Uh, that's where it started. Um, everything else sort of evolved around that. Um, we've got uh, we've got two surf coaches, two senior surf coaches, three junior coaches that run the surfing part of the program. Then we've got two lifeguards, and that that sort of plugs into the surfing program because they provide safety on the beach. Um, it takes a little bit of the load off of the surf coaches because they don't have to make sure that the kids are safe in the water. They can focus more just on coaching. Um, we've always had an educational component to the program, but it's always been very informal uh, until recently where we employed a, a former primary school teacher and now the educational component is very much formalized uh, because she's an actual teacher uh, rather than a surf coach trying to help kids with homework, which doesn't always work. Um, and there's a nutritional component that, you know, a lot of these kids don't eat. Um, at home so they'll get fed at school and then after school they'll get fed at the program uh we we pr uh, we prepare about 60 meals per day um that's prepared by the coaches themselves um and uh yeah that's that's pretty much an overview of of what happens on a daily basis just curious what when you say prepare meals what i don't know what a traditional meal would be for to prepare there are they just making sandwiches or are they actually cooking or no, they're actually cooking. Um, so these are th these meals are sponsored by uh, an organization um, that's a countrywide after school feeding program. So they'll provide food to organizations. Well, what they actually do is they connect donors to organizations that do after school feeding programs. And so um, we get delivered four boxes per month and it's dried stuff that you can basically just prepare on a little gas stove by adding water. It's, you know, um, maize meal, beans, pasta, you know, sauces, that kind of thing. From time to time, we we buy some fresh vegetables and put that in there too. Oh. Well, do you, is this something that you would eat when you're there or is it? Uh... Um, I would eat it, yeah. yeah. I don't, but I would. Um, it's, uh, you know, the kids do sometimes <laughs> complain that it gets repetitive, um, but it's nutritious. That's what matters. Um, we don't we don't feed them crap. It's stuff that actually you know helps build their body and muscles and and so on. Um, and it's 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 good quality stuff that 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 we get um, sponsored with. It, the, the organization that we get that from, they do a good job. Now, uh, uh, speaking of feeding the crap, I know that something we've talked about is as the youth in the program start earning sats. Um, and go to the stores and start spending them on things you know sometimes you cringe a little bit at what they want to buy which is normal if kids you know they're going to want to buy junk food but uh i was kind of touched that you said recently you've seen that kind of shift even in the choices they're making on the food that they're buying that they're starting to actually think about the nutritional value or or maybe they just got tired of eating crap i don't know what <laughs> what do you think has uh, brought that about um it's it's hard to say i mean so so you you're referring to the to the kids who who earn rewards on a on a bi-weekly basis um they get about a dollar and a half per week and um yes they were buying total crap in the beginning um but we have seen some of them starting to buy sausages and you know frozen meat and you know it, it, it could be that a lot of that was coming from the parents um although um a lot of those parents don't care enough to 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 do that sort of thing so i i don't know what it is i mean it it could be it could be the coaches that have been encouraging them to you know buy stuff to take home 
Um, it could be that, you know, it's in some way related to, to using Bitcoin as a form of money um, because it makes them question things that they wouldn't have questioned before. Um, you know, I've always wondered what effect it has on a person when they see the price of something go up and down on a weekly basis. And it, it makes you wonder, oh, well, why is the price going up and down and makes you wonder about all kinds of things. So yeah, it could be any one of those things. It's hard to say exactly what it is, but it's interesting to see it happen. So e even the fact that you suggested that it could be related to Bitcoin, if this was a couple of years ago, I would have, you know, kind of just laughed at that because, you know, it's, yeah, Bitcoin's really going to change the way you think about eating. But I've seen it here in El Salvador in the program that we do. When people start earning Bitcoin, it does change their time preferences. They start looking at everything like, OK, maybe I should rather than go to work right away. Maybe I should stay in school so that I can earn more longer term. Um, even when it comes to buying crap, we've seen them think like, do I really want to give up these sats to buy a Coke or some, you know, crappy pastry? Or should I rather, you know, keep these because I think in five years it's going to be worth 10 times as much. So it really does shift something inside of people. And when we started, I never would have, you know, that was not something that I was banking on or even thinking about. And it kind of took me by surprise of, okay, why are these people saving and making better choices all of a sudden? It, it's, you know, definitely not something we were teaching them. It was something they were coming to on their own. Yeah, I think I think with, with the kids, um, I can't say 100% for sure that that is what it is, with, uh, that it is Bitcoin related. I think that's what it is because I've seen the effect in myself and I've seen the effect in other people. But where I am 100% sure that it is Bitcoin related is with the coaches, the people who are actually uh, working for the program and earning their salaries. And, and to see them save is, is encouraging. Um, and to see them, you know, this is something that I've been trying to instill in, in these coaches for many years and I've been unsuccessful, um, until more recently. Um, and I, and I think, I think I've been unsuccessful where I've been unsuccessful introducing Bitcoin has been successful because introducing Bitcoin into this, into the program has done something which I couldn't do on my own. Um, and it's, it's, it's encouraged our coaches to start thinking more about the future. Um, that's never really been the case before. And now it definitely is the case. They are, they are saving for the future. They are thinking long term. They, they are starting to make different choices about, you know, family, about having children, about where they want to live, about, you know, all, all these things. And that's, that's something that's changed drastically over the last year and a half. And the only other thing that's changed that's we've, we've introduced Bitcoin. So, the correlation there is, is pretty clear. I think there's this huge uh, underestimation of the corrosive effect that inflation has on people's time preferences. And, and, and it's natural. If you look at it, like, why are you going to save in something that's going to be worth less in the future? Why not just spend it now? And so instead of saving and preparing for the future, they're incentivized to spend it now because, well, it's just going to be worth less in the future. And so when you take that component out and give them something that, that you know, they can look at historically over longer time periods has gone up in value, all of a sudden it turns that on their its head where, no, why would I want to spend this now when I think five years from now, it's going to be worth significantly more. And we've seen that in El Salvador. It used to be that for local people, you know, really the best way to save would be to buy cement blocks because they knew because of inflation that these blocks would cost more in the future. And so it's better to buy them now because they know in a couple of years they want to build something and they just let the blocks sit there. But that's hard to get excited about saving cement blocks and then they could still get robbed or they could get damaged. There's other problems to it. So it's not it kind of robs them of the incentive to save. But if they have all of a sudden the ability to save in the world's hardest money, it it really gives them the drive and desire where that didn't exist before. And that's that's where I always really push back hard on Bitcoiners, because there's been this narrative of, 
oh, why would you spend your Bitcoin? You know, you should spend your fiat and save in Bitcoin. But when you're spending Bitcoin, it actually makes you question every time you spend it. Do I really want to give up my sats? Where when you're dealing in fiat, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll throw some money at that, buy this crap. And you don't really think about it. But when you realize you're actually trading your time and your potential um, appreciation in the future for this momentary, you know, Coca-Cola or little trinket, it makes you have second thoughts about that and actually spend wiser. And so that's why I always tell people, yeah, you should be living on a Bitcoin standard. You should be buying your coffee with Bitcoin, because if it's not worth the sats you're giving up, then it's also not worth the fiat you're giving up because you could have used that fiat to buy Bitcoin. So it's the same thing. And that's where I think there's sometimes a disconnect from people that it is the the spending of Bitcoin that will actually push you to use your money more wisely. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It's it's interesting. Like when you know the, the 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 thing that comes to mind is also some of the shop owners who are less directly connected to our program. We've got them on them on board to accept Bitcoin. Whereas I'm very directly involved with the coaches and I've always, from the beginning, when we introduced Bitcoin, I was saying like, guys, you know, should, you should try and save in this. It's an opportunity and educating them. I've been less directly involved with the shop owners because the coaches have been the ones that onboard the shops. And so it's been even more interesting to see some of the shop owners become you know, long-term holders and um there's there's one lady in particular who's the first shop that we got on board um and uh she's holding on to a significant amount of bitcoin and i know because every time you know there's a big drop in the price we go around and we'll ask these shop owners listen are you still okay is everything fine and and she would then talk to the coaches and show them her wallet and they're quite open with each other like in in that and it's still a very intimate you know sort of thing there's not too many people aware of what we're doing yet so so they know how much bitcoin she's holding on to and it's been really it's been pretty impressive to see that she's despite the the, the downturn in price she, she saw the price run up quite a bit and then she's she's seen it go down quite a bit and i think that that even though the price has gone down i think she's grasped the concept that this is a you know it's it's a long-term thing and that it's going to go down but it's going to come up again and that's what she keeps telling the coaches every time they come to her and ask her why is, is she worried and she's like no 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 it'll go up again it'll go up again i'm holding on i'm holding on so it's, it's really cool to see because that's not something that i encourage this is something that sort of happened kind of on its own <laughs> No, it's it's like you're saying, it's those things you couldn't really plan for or even no. think about that you're surprised. Wow, Bitcoin really does fix this. It has all these secondary impacts on life. And so I think that's there's a lot of things around here in El Zante that I see that have changed that, you know, when you first look at it, it's not directly linked to Bitcoin, but in a roundabout way it is because the the things have improved because of the overall impact it has had on yeah. just the way things happen here. And yeah, no, the, quite remarkable. the second order effects are are the most astonishing things. I mean, we've I've seen some things that I couldn't have anticipated, um, things that I couldn't have planned for. Sometimes little things, sometimes big things. Um, it's impacted family dynamics in some situations where, you know, people have. You know, there's been ways in which some of the, especially especially when it comes to the junior coaches, the guys that are still school kids that are earning a part-time salary, there were some situations where in which they were, you know, providing for the family, but they were providing for those things that weren't really benefiting the family, but more sort of like, you know, if it's cigarettes for the mother or stuff like the stuff that a kid shouldn't be buying for their yeah. parents. and it's it's kind of like adjusted the family dynamics in strange ways because bitcoin is a different kind of money it's a kind of money that puts the individual um in control of their own you know sovereignty so it's it's and, and these are things that i i couldn't have anticipated i've been i've i've had an eye-opening experience in the way in which bitcoin was adopted i did not i didn't expect it to be adopted in the way it has been so it's been it's been kind of an interesting journey for me the last year and a half in comparison to the time I spent before then in Bitcoin, because before that I was in my own little social environment with Bitcoin, and now I'm in a very, very, very different socio-economic situation with Bitcoin, and it's, it's being adopted in a very different way that I that I had anticipated. I think one of the 
most exciting things for me, especially going to these past two conferences we were in the, this last month, first in Argentina and then this last week here in El Salvador, was seeing how the term circular economy is now a thing. When we started, people just look at me like, no, there's, that's never going to happen. There's no way. Nobody's ever going to spend their Bitcoin. You guys are like crazy. There's, I mean, you're kind of silly was kind of the response that we had a lot of times. Where now I hear people talking about, no, we're building a circular economy here. Or we're seeing this circular economy. And we're seeing it even in the way the Bitcoiners that come to the conference are out spending their sats. Because last year, even though people were excited about what was happening in El Salvador, they still had this mentality of, no, I'm, I'm just stacking. I'm not ever going to spend. I'm going to spend my fiat. Where now I think they realize that's silly. Anytime you're holding fiat, there's an opportunity cost of holding of having Bitcoin at that same time. So you might as well be in Bitcoin and be spending in Bitcoin because you're going to spend more wisely if you're spending in Bitcoin. And so this year, I saw everybody doing everything in Bitcoin. People were paying for their coffees in Bitcoin. They're paying for their hotel rooms here in El Zante. I mean, they're spending it everywhere. So it's been pretty, uh, pretty amazing to see just that transformation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've been spending Bitcoin for a long time because at many times in my life, it's been the only form of money I had. So, um, I think it makes sense to spend Bitcoin. I mean, you can't just forever hold on to it. Like at some point you have to start living. And if it's the only form of money that you're using, then then you have to. And I think it's great to see that there are more circular economies popping up because I've always been of the opinion that, you know, Bitcoin is not going to reach its true potential for, for doing what it can do if people don't spend it. Like it's, you know, it's obviously not just a store of value. It also has to be a medium of exchange. Um, and for that to happen, people have to start spending it. And I think encouraging people to spend it, but to spend it responsibly, obviously. Um, but yeah, like you say, to rather spend Bitcoin rather than fiat, um, that's what's going to get the ball rolling and spread these types of endeavors to more places. And this is what gets Bitcoin adopted more widely. Um, so it, it is encouraging to see, definitely. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of strange the first time somebody came up to me and said like listen here we also want to do that and i was like yeah that's kind of why i that's how i felt when i first saw bitcoin beach and i i hope there's thousands of other communities like that that pop up all over the place i think for people seeing projects like yours or what's happening in guatemala with bitcoin lake or motive in peru um, or all these, I mean, I found out about like 10 other projects, I think, in this last week is it's changing people's mindset about how they think about those things, because all we've heard is, no, spend your fiat, save, save your Bitcoin, stack sats. And, you know, a lot of people I respect, somebody like Michael Saylor say like, no, it's the hardest money. You shouldn't be spending it. But I, I really think there's no reason to look at it like that and live when like you're living in two different worlds it's better to be living on bitcoin because then it actually forces you to plan better to spend better and it has all these kind of second order impacts on you and so for me that was kind of thrilling to see how much the narrative has changed even in the last year and that people are actually realizing that if Bitcoin is going to meet its potential, we need to use it. We need to yeah. see circulating economies. The dollar and the other currencies will never go away if we're not willing to spend our Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. That's that's pretty much what I was trying to say is that the dollar and the, the other currencies won't go away. If we, if we keep on spending them, they will remain used. And so we have to start using Bitcoin instead, really. Yeah. I um I think we have some pictures here of the uh, educational center that you guys built pretty yeah. recently. So I would love to hear about that and just the role Paxful's played in that. I believe they're partnering with you guys. Um, yeah, education obviously is is a huge need in all the developing you know societies, but I think especially in uh, where the, the townships where you guys are working. I know the schools are not very good. There's lack of even basic education, basic math skills. And so it's hard to teach people about Bitcoin if they can't even do the most basic things. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how that started, how it came apart, the role Paxful's playing. Yeah, um, I think 
I think when we started out with this project, um, it was one of the one of the uh, Bitcoiners in the local South African Bitcoin community. Um, he was he came to visit the project very very early on, um, and uh, he pointed out to me that we have to have a physical presence in the township, um, and I hadn't really thought about it until then because we. The entire program was based under the beach where the surfer kids have always been operating with, you know, we've got headquarters. Which makes at, sense. If you're doing a surfing project, you're going to be based yeah, at the beach. You have to be based at the beach. Um, but, uh, and w once we started introducing Bitcoin into the picture, it was difficult to get, you know, shop owners and people who were not related to surfing to get them down to the beach. And you know, it's only a kilometer and a half, but it's a different world. You know, you've got hotels and stuff down there that the people from the township, it's just outside of their world. So he pointed out to me that you need a you need a presence in the township and that's where the idea for the education center was sort of born from because the, originally the idea was to you know it's it's not only for the children it's for the shop owners and for anyone in the community that want to come in and learn about bitcoin um the focus is the kids uh, because we've already got them in the program um and keeping them busy is, is pretty important that's the whole reason for the surf kids but um so we've got uh, we've got the the children's education program happening in the afternoons after school, um, and so you know there's there's a program running up at the education center and one down at the beach for kids um, simultaneously, and then those two groups sort of swap around. And then in the mornings, that same education center is used for community members, for shop owners, for people who have questions about Bitcoin. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult to encourage adults from the community to come in and ask questions um you know and 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 that's why it's great to work with kids in general i think because kids are way more open and, and receptive to new information um and so it's it's you know it's that, that's one of the things i would say to anyone trying to launch this sort of thing is like get the kids involved you know don't don't necessarily focus all your attention on trying to orange pull adults um because it's way easier to work with kids they're more receptive they're more open to to new information and and you know there's nothing better than seeing a child going into a shop and spending bitcoin because then people are like oh what's that kid doing it makes it easier to sort of introduce the whole thing so but yeah the, the education center is run by the teacher who we now employ um sponsored by paxful and uh, the built with bitcoin foundation those guys have been awesome they've come on board and and supported us like that um and uh, yeah we've got a couple of computers in there um we show the kids videos we've got some books proper bitcoin books that we're trying to work through um it's tough because you know literacy skills and language skills are unfortunately not where they should be um the education you know we have to focus a lot on basic education because a lot of these kids don't learn what they should be learning at school um the schools are understaffed overpopulated underfunded the teachers are overworked the bureau bureaucracy is killing them. They spend more than half their time filling out paperwork, not actually teaching. So, um, yeah, we're trying to do what we can. And um, it's a relatively small group of kids, but I think, the, again, the second order effects, the second, you know, the, the, the after effects are where it's going to be at. Those kids talk to their brothers, who talk to their uncles, who talk to their grannies, who talk to their uncles, and that's where it's going to happen. So how did you guys connect with Paxful? Did did you go to them or did they seek you out or how did that transpire? That um, I actually think they they reached out to us very early on. Um, and then we just kind of kept that relationship going, uh, kept on talking to them. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of conversations back and forth. Um, and eventually I proposed the idea to them that this is what we want to do. Um, there were some, there were a lot of other people involved in that conversation too. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, there, there was the marketing department from Paxful. There were people from outside, you know, built with Bitcoin foundation was part of the process. Um, you know, I don't want to single anyone out, yeah. but there was a lot of people involved in making it happen. Um, and it, it took a while. Um, but they've been, you know, I think they are very much focused in the right way. Like their aim is adoption and it's adoption of the masses in those parts of the world where you don't necessarily have the type of access that you have in, in first world countries. So I think, I think they, they align very well with, with, with where we're going. Um, no, I, I think Paxful does a great job and they really do have 
well, a real um, vision for what Africa could become. I know that, that that is one of their real focuses, but they understand the importance of education and they're willing to give back. And they've built a number of schools, done a number of things. We've seen in, in El Salvador, just their attitude about things. They, they really care about the community as a whole. And they, they see Bitcoin as a tool that can, can help, but it's not the end all be all. Like they care about the actual communities. And so um, yeah. it's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun getting to know the guys at Paxful. Uh, I would like to take credit for uh, lightning pilling uh, Ray because <laughs> he somehow wound up at my house here last year during adopting Bitcoin. He he didn't have a place, a uh, hotel or anything. Everything was booked up. And somehow this giant uh, Egyptian guy was uh, <laughs> staying in my guest house and got to know him uh, some. And I was talking to him about making payments and he said he had never made a lightning payment before. I was like, what in the world? You run this huge organization. You've never done any lightning payments. All right, we got to go to the store and show you how easy it is. And he was kind of shocked at how instant it happened. Yeah. And I think they added lightning to their platform a couple months later, which which is huge for what they do. It's I mean, massive. lightning is is enormous. So yeah. uh, I love Paxful. I love what they're doing. I love their hustle and their their real going out and getting in the communities. And so I. When I heard that they were partnering with you guys, I was like, "No, that is perfect." Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm very. I, I, I love the fact that they integrated Lightning. Um, you know, I, I become less and less interested in, um, in Bitcoin-related services if Lightning is not integrated. Um, at this point in time, it sort of feels like. I mean, I'm not a technical developer, but it feels like yeah, if Paxful could do it. Then you know, there's many other companies that are not doing it that should be doing it really. Um, but then again, you know, each to their own. Um, but I think, yeah, that's incredible that they have Lightning. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, yeah, these guys are heading in the right direction because Lightning is where it's at. I yeah, think. and I think Lightning. I mean, we've we've had this conversation. In fact, I, I got into it with um, some of the folks that are involved with Achieva Wallet because they don't have Lightning as the default within the wallet, and it really creates all these headaches and hurdles mm. and makes it so things don't work. And so. That's always my push on everybody is lightning should be the default. You should always be able to go on chain if you choose to, but lightning should be the default for, for anything that's consumer based. Obviously, yeah. if it's something that are large purchases um, for both security and and cost wise, you should be doing stuff on chain. But anything that's a small purchase should default to lightning. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I mean, lightning, lightning, I think is where it's at because it's like you say, small purchases. That's what's going to bring adoption to the masses um, it are these small purchases that people make on a daily basis. And that that all of it need, needs to be on Lightning. I mean, more than 95% of what we do is on Lightning. Um, so if it wasn't for that, there's no way we could, you know, do this. It doesn't make sense to make a transaction that's expensive and slow if you're going to be doing it for little small things. So I think that too is why the circular economy concept and the focus in these grassroots efforts are is so important to bitcoin as a whole because it's helping drive these things forward it i mean i really think it is because of these projects that lightning is where it's at we saw in el salvador with el salvador adopting bitcoin lightning had this huge surge of interest the people investing in it and it mm. really forced the developers because they're like okay they're gonna use this we need to make sure it's ready yeah. And so I think it is these small community projects. Maybe you know, people say, oh, well, it's just one small little thing, but it helps drive the whole thing forward and pave the way for bigger communities, even countries to, to follow. Yeah. I mean, like I always emphasize to people that our project is still pretty small. You know, we only have 10, 11, maybe 12 shops on board by now. Um, but the thing is, it's not it's not the size it's not the size that that matters <laughs> it's not the size it's not the size of the little circular economy that you try to build that matters it's what matters is how many how many others like that can you exp inspire to pop up like if you're if you're building a circular economy and you've only got 10 shops and you've got you know three four maybe whatever i mean we've got we've got five people who earn salaries full-time and four part-time and you know 10 11 shops it's, it's pretty small but if we can inspire 100 more like that then that's significant. Um, so it's not it's not about how many shops and how many people. 
in your particular project it's about how many others can you inspire to to do the same thing and the more the merrier really that's we need lots of them and we learned that pretty quickly as things kind of blew up here after the bitcoin law we felt this responsibility of oh we need to scale up and we need to help all of el salvador on board and and these other people are coming to us and we quickly realized well, we can't do all this and we really shouldn't even be trying like really the value and the ethos of Bitcoin is doing things in a decentralized way. And so yeah. that's what's been so fun is seeing all these other projects um, pop up around the world. And even once, you know, we had people come to us at first like, hey, somebody's claiming to be Bitcoin Beach and someplace else. And like, no, that's great. Like the more projects, the better, you know, as long as they're remaining true to being Bitcoin only and they're really vested in the community and, you know, it's not some type of scam. We, we love that there's other Bitcoin beaches popping up or yeah. Bitcoin lakes or Bitcoin Nikasi or Bitcoin, you know, all these different projects. It's it's all trying to solve the same problem. Yeah. And that's um, yeah, I, I think that's what's different of that bottom up type focus versus people that want everything to be yeah. top down. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's been something that for me has you know really taken a lot of weight off my shoulders just realizing hey we just do our thing in this community and make sure we don't lose our way and and forget the people that we started this for and yeah. we can just focus on them and let all these other people worry about their own communities and they'll have people that'll rise up and do way better than we could if we were going to try to you know take it all under our wings yeah, that's that's the beauty of decentralization, um, and that's that's part of why I've believed in Bitcoin, and why I've been so obsessed. I've been I've been obsessed with Bitcoin's Bitcoin's you know promise for a long time because it's just this idea of decentralization makes sense. You you cannot run the world from a centralized position of power. It just it just doesn't make sense, and we see that in so many aspects of society where it just goes horribly wrong, and it creates all these problems that you know um seem so complex but comes back to the idea of centralized control and it's it's beautiful to see that this idea of the circular economy is growing in the same way in, in different being done in different ways in different places um but yeah really the more the more of them there are the more of them there are the more powerful the movement becomes and it really pushes bitcoin adoption forward um and i think i think that's what the community wants to see um and i think that's why there's been generally a very positive response to these types of projects um and uh, yeah i hope that there's many more to come the the funnest thing about being in the bitcoin space is that kind of community like nobody cares who gets the credit for things it's it's all about just pushing the the adoption forward and and it's not just about adoption for adoption's sake but really like bringing people fairness and ability to participate in the economy on a level playing field. And we've gotten so much help along the way um, from different organizations. Uh, one was uh, Blockchain for Humanity that did, helped us do a lot of educational initiatives in the beginning. Uh, the other was La, La Bitcoinetta. Uh, when they did the conference here last year, they actually donated a vehicle to us that the project is uh, an educational initiative out of Argentina where they take this van kind of all around the country and, you know, places way off the beaten path and do Bitcoin education. And so when they heard El Salvador was adopting Bitcoin and they decided to do the LaBitConf conference here last year, they had this dream to drive the Bitcoinetta up from Argentina to El Salvador. So I think they got up to like Ecuador or something, but with the, um, all the lockdowns because of COVID, it was horrible trying to cross the borders. And so they kind of switched gears and said, hey, let's get another Bitcoin ETA. We'll do a Volkswagen bus, an old style, you know, surf bus, and we will paint it all orange and deck it all out and and have it for the conference. And then they donated it to us. And that's been a huge part of what we do. We have this surf for everyone program. And so we use that as part of that program. It's also the the you know the backdrop for all the photos when people come to Hope House they want to you know take their photo in front of the the Bitcoinetta and then this last year it kind of popped in my mind that you guys needed a vehicle and so um, 
we're going to share some photos here. And uh, we were able to present this in Argentina, the La Bitcoinet uh, South Africa edition. And you made this happen, Herman. I This is way beyond what, what I was anticipating. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about that and, and how you think that's going to impact the project. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the coolest things I've seen um, in a long time. I I can't take full credit for that. I mean, the idea came from La Bitcoinera and this idea of, a, you know, a, a vehicle that attracts attention and then leverages that to, you know, spread Bitcoin adoption. Um, I don't think I would have would have done that out of my own, but then having given being given this idea and then with the help of people on the ground, um, yeah, I mean, the vehicle is is an old Land Cruiser. It's a 1994 model. It's got almost I think half a million kilometers on the clock. Um, it looks pretty good for its age, um, and with the help of a fellow Bitcoiner. Um, we organized, you know, all these decorative aspects. You know, there's lots of elements on there. There's a honey badger walking around on the wheel arches. There's, you know, a bull and a bear on the bonnet, either side of the logo. There's the magic internet money wizard somewhere there. Um, the jerry cans, which is where you would normally carry the fuel and it's got rockets on it. Um, you know, so it's, I, I think it's gonna draw a lot of attention in, in the local town where we based, um, especially over the coming December holidays. That town gets a lot of tourists. Um, it's, you know, it feels, it, it sometimes feels like half the country comes down to that specific town for, for Christmas and New Year. And so it's going to draw a lot of attention. Um, and I hope lots of people take their photo next to it. Um, I hope to eventually that we can, you know, again, follow the La Bitcoinera sort of ethos and, and, and take the vehicle out to areas where people don't normally have access to the internet, where they don't have access to learning materials. Um, and we can take Bitcoin education to these sorts of places because I know that's what La Bitcoinera does, um, does too. Uh, but even if it only draws attention in the local town where we're based, that'll be fantastic. Uh, make people aware of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm particularly stoked with that, the pair of horns in, on the front of the vehicle. <laughs> um those those are proper kudu horns um trophy trophy horns the, those are fantastic um, Wait, do you guys paint them or is that uh vinyl or what, what's on no there? They, they they spray paint it okay um they don't obviously the animal doesn't look like that in, in nature <laughs> <laughs> um but but those are real horns they come they came off of a, a real animal um it's a kudu a kudu bull it's it's a beautiful animal um uh yeah so i think um I think we're going to draw a lot of attention and I think we're going to leverage that to, you know, make people aware of what we're trying to do. Um, it's hard to get people to pay attention to the right thing. And I think this thing is going to draw attention um, and we can we can use that to our advantage. No, I think that uh, vehicle there is going to be responsible for a lot of uh, orange pilling. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely those things that make people ask questions, and and that opens the uh, ability to have that first conversation and you know help them get their first sats and start to understand you know why Bitcoin can have such an impact on their life and and why it's so important. Um, speak, speaking of which, there was some videos uh, a couple weeks ago. Well, I guess. You guys are you guys are great about sending videos out. There's been a constant stream of them coming out that have caused quite a bit of waves just showing people first in your project, but then even later, it looks like the major supermarkets there, you can just go right in and, and use Bitcoin pretty easily. Um, I don't know if we can see the videos there, um, get those playing there and have them, uh, people be able to see kind of some of the, how easy it is for them to, so that's um that's that's one of our junior coaches um that's luke angele uh, that well obviously not that that's the shopkeeper but that's luke angele buying some groceries this this video drew a lot of attention um this is in the this is in the township this is at one of the stores that's um, been on board for a while um and i mean they're that they're, they're buying snacks you know it's it's small amounts of money that they're spending at a time so again you know this lighting is is what it's all about um and is are you guys mostly using wallet of satoshi i see that uh being used right there um on the on the spending side yes on on the receiving side it's a combination of a few different wallets 
um, depending on the setup in the shop. Um, because we don't have any developers on our team, we've had to use what we can download from the App Store. Um, and when we started off, there weren't there, there also weren't that many wallets that had the conversion rate to local fiat currency, which was pretty important. Uh, people don't think in terms of dollars. Um, these are some of the kids that are spending their weekly rewards. Again, also, you know, really small purchases. Um, yeah, so the, the coaches don't tell the kids what to buy. Um, you'll see some of them buying, like that one, you know, buying bread and sausages, but some of them buy crap. So, yeah. You know, it's about, normal. It's, about, it's normal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about half off. But we, we've been pretty specific about not telling them what to buy. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 cool to see. And it's it's also nice to go to the various shops and and draw attention to the fact that the kids are spending, but they're not spending regular cash. They're spending something else. And people people tend to pay attention when there's thirty kids standing in a queue outside a store. Um, you know, all dressed with similar similar t-shirts. Um, so, have you had any store owners FOMO in uh, wanting to accept Bitcoin because they're wondering why uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that store has a line of yeah, kids no, out 100%, front? Hundred percent, hundred percent. A lot of the some of the stores that have been very like sort of pushing back against coming on board. Um, once they started seeing kids going into the other stores on a weekly basis, they definitely started asking more questions. Uh, that's been one of the reasons why stores came on board. Uh, another another reason is security. Some of the stores are interested in the security aspects that Bitcoin offers, being able to store it very securely for very cheap um, relative to a bank account. Um, but yeah, the kids have helped a lot. This is the supermarket. Okay, um, so so this was this kind of blew my mind. Uh, the smaller stores, you know, we have something very similar in El Salvador with all the stores, but you guys are actually much further along with the su the supermarket here has done a horrible job so far. They <laughs> they're using the Chivo app. It sucked. It's it doesn't work most of the time, but you guys got it down here. I mean, these kids walk in and they're buying individual items with lightning, the receipt printing out. It really blew my mind. In fact, I tweeted this out afterwards at Chivo at Super Selectus, which is the supermarket chain here and said, hey, you guys need to get your act together. We're leading the way. And, and you know, yeah. in South Africa, they're doing a much better job at it. So hopefully they'll take notice or or maybe even call the company that's providing these services yeah. and, and get on board. Hopefully. I mean, the, the company that 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 built this integration has done a fantastic job. Um, we 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 helped them with testing. And then obviously, once it became public, we helped them with a bit of PR because I think it helped them quite a bit that we posted this in it. Um, I, I think it helped their PR campaign a lot that, you know, we've got kids from a poor neighborhood demonstrating how easy it is to use this, you know, um, it sort of, you know, makes it more approachable to anyone else. People who might be a little bit suspicious go, oh, well, if those kids can do it, then why can't I do it? So, um, but yeah, the company who built this thing did a fantastic job. Um, they, they, they proper, proper lighting developers. I mean, I was just fascinated watching them build this thing from the sidelines. Um, and uh, I was very excited when they finally gave us the go ahead to make it public because they, it wasn't sure that it was going to be released. Like the, the supermarket store was very enthusiastic about it. They were really happy about it. In fact, I think, I think the, the, the owners of that supermarket chain has been Orange Bull, um, nice. if I'm not mistaken. And it's because of the fees. Um, but the, the problem was the banks. Um, they struggled to get a banking partner that would come on board and, and help them out. Um, but yeah, when they finally made it public, I was, I was super stoked because I mean, this, this could potentially be integrated at any store with an existing credit card terminal. Um, it's, it's a basic, you know, software update type of thing. There's no extra hardware needed in the stores. And, and most of these big chain stores have those types of credit card terminals. So this, this could go very far. I, th I think that's pretty much along the lines of what what Strike was kind of saying that they were going to do, but I haven't actually seen them doing it anywhere where there I see in South Africa, like just yeah. working at this, mm. you know, chain store that most people, most of us have never even heard of before. And it's working yeah. seamlessly. So 
hopefully we'll see these things rolling out in the U.S. and other places. And hopefully, um, yeah, I mean, there's no reason it shouldn't be working here in El Salvador. Like that, it's ridiculous that the stores, uh, that the supermarket doesn't have a system like this set up. So yeah. we're gonna do our best to start making some noise and start pushing. For the first year of things here, we we try. You know, we understand it was a huge endeavor for the country to overnight basically start accepting bitcoin and so we wanted to have some patience and let everybody try to get things together but at this point it's been a year it's time for us to start making some noise <laughs> and you know or at least give them the phone number of this company in south africa and say hey if, if chivo can't figure this out here's a company that you know okay. has it dialed in so let's make it work yeah no i think i think they built a fantastic integration from the from the consumer side it feels like a seamless lightning payment it's it really is i mean it, it's quick it's 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 like paying with a credit card really at, at, at the shop and all it takes is one little app integration you download one little simple app on your phone and that basically plugs into whatever lightning wallet you want to use you don't you're not even restricted to which lightning wallet you want to use the app picks up all the lightning wallets on your phone and it, it lets you decide which one you want to plug it into and from there on you're basically spending sats from your preferred lighting wallet. It's it's a fantastic experience. Um, I've done my grocery shopping at that shop using this thing for the last four months. Um, the company is called Crypto Convert, um, and it's it's uh, one of the founders is also early co-founder of one of South Africa's biggest exchanges, um, and he's a proper lighting developer. So. Yeah, it's it's fantastic to see this sort of thing happening. I mean, again, it's not just us, you know, it's there's there's this whole community building on top of Bitcoin. And that's that's incredible to see. Well, I think you were mentioning for the stores, they don't have to get any new hardware. It can no. be integrated in their existing system. And that is so crucial because, you know, stores don't want to like have to redo their whole system or have a separate system to accept Bitcoin. So really, the developers have to do things like this that make it easy and make it stupid for them to not have it integrated because now every time somebody pays with bitcoin instead of a credit card they're saving a significant amount of money and fees without having to have an you know additional contraption to worry about breaking or needing to have a you know service on anything like mm -hmm. that they it's yeah. like a win-win solution in fact the person the person sitting behind the teller doesn't know that you're paying with bitcoin from their perspective, it looks like you're paying with a banking app or, or whatever else. So it really is. I was surprised by how easy it was to do that the first time without having to explain to the person, press there, press there, do that, do that. None of that. It was it was really quite simple. So yeah, it's been a it's been a privilege to be involved in that process. Really, um, yeah, <laughs> very exciting. So um, I'm going to ask you the question that, that everybody always asks me and uh, I, I've never feel like I have a, a great answer to or I don't have the answer to give them that they want. But uh, what what's next? What are you guys looking to next? <laughs> what is the uh, next step for you guys? Um, I mean, it's I, I don't know, to be honest, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think I think for me, you know, and, and I think having having been to these two conferences sort of like gave me a clearer idea of maybe where we could go with this. Um, a, a great thing to to be able to do would be to take that one little township community and turn it upside down. Um, it's been it's been really difficult. I mean, it has happened in some areas of what, South Africa. What do you mean by turn it upside down? Just to 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 flip the narrative on its head you know where a township is a place where you you avoid it people don't go there um, i mean this is one of the reasons why we haven't onboarded more shops because there's no one from outside is going to come in and spend bitcoin there tourists are specifically told to avoid townships um, locals avoid it uh, unless you unless you really need to be there you don't go there um, and even, i mean even speaking for myself i wouldn't go there at night um, and during the day, if I do go there, I'm, I'm, I tend to be pretty careful about where I go. Um, you know, so if, if we can flip the narrative on its head and turn this one little township into a place where people actually want to go. Um, and I kind of, I kind of feel like the Bitcoin community is the right, the right target market for that because they tend to be more adventurous and more daring. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like somebody asked me this question um the other day why 
why is surfing and and wh wh why why do these projects seem to, why do some of these projects seem to have this thing in common and i and i when i thought about it i, I thought well, it actually makes sense because when when surfers travel around the world they look for waves they don't care where it is it could be in the middle of nowhere it could be in a dangerous place it's like well i don't care i'll go there if there's a good wave bitcoiners are sort of like that too you know like if there's a place where i can spend my bitcoin I'll go there for the sake of that. It doesn't matter if it's a more dangerous area. So if we can maybe sort of, you know, leverage that and attract people to this township and then flip the narrative on its head and say, well, look, this is actually a place where people are coming to, you know, let's maybe, you know, there's a guest house that pops up in the middle of the township. I mean, this sort of thing has happened in other areas of South Africa, but it's a tough thing to do. Um, that'd be really cool if we can, if we can help make that happen. Um, you know, using Bitcoin as the driver behind that sort of economic turnaround. Um, that'd be fantastic. Um, I don't know how much further than that we could take it. I mean, really the only thing I can hope for other than that is that we keep on doing this and that it inspires more people to do the same thing. There are other communities like this um, starting to show its head in South Africa. There are, there's one other one that they're trying to onboard a village onto the Lightning Network um, they've got their own node up and running and we'll see how that goes. Um, so that's really cool. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's basically what's next. I would like to, you know, flip the narrative on this particular township and see if that's even possible. Um, that'd be great. That'd be really cool. <laughs> if we can do that, I'd say it's mission accomplished. <laughs> I, I just remembered now when you mentioned, uh, you know, that, that they are running a node that you said that one of the, your coaches is running his own node and is managing channels, which I have no idea where I would even start with that. And I know that makes me sound really bad as a Bitcoiner to, to not, but that's just not my skill set. And so I was super impressed when you were telling me that he's managing his lightning channels and, um, yeah, yeah it's amazing what people are capable of when they're given the opportunity yes um it, it's amazing what, what what a person is capable of i mean this guy is a senior coach with the program uh he's been with us for four years and uh you know it's it's, it's a fantastic opportunity and i think um there's a couple of things about bitcoin that that makes this opportunity more real it's this connection that he now has to the rest of the world um where all of a sudden he's part of something bigger. Um, he, you know, he's been introduced to a common objective, a common mission that shared, that, that is shared by many people all, all across the world. Um, whereas before it was kind of isolated, you know, um, it's just one little program trying to help kids, but not really a common purpose with, with millions of other people all around the world. So I think that that's really motivated, um, you know uh, the coaches and um yeah i mean i also I, I don't know how to run a lightning node i've tried it's beyond me i mean i guess if i had more time then I, I could also figure it out if i really you know hacked away at it uh but it's been inspiring to see to see that coach in particular lutando is his name he's he's the he's been with us longer than anyone else was he the one that was watching live during the conference that everybody gave a shout out to yes yeah, he was watching live. He sent me a photo. Um, I think it was, I think it was 10 p.m. Uh, their side, so it was way, way past his working hours. But he was watching live. There was two of them watching himself and the other senior coach was watching live. But yes, Lutando was the one I, I gave a shout out to on stage. Um, it's just been truly inspiring to see. Um, to see that change uh, happen happen in that guy. He's come so far over this last year and a half um it's kind of it's almost the kind of thing which um you know i i was sort of becoming a little bit disillusioned before i started the bitcoin project i didn't know if it'd be worth it was possible because i mean i've been i've been trying to initiate this sort of change in the coaches and the kids for for years and i was it was hard to to get i had to put a lot of energy into to make that change and more often than not it wouldn't happen and now all of a sudden it's happening and it almost seems a lot more organic and i can't help but to come to the conclusion that it's because of the introduction of bitcoin and the connection to this wider mission the shared mission um 
that that's made that made that happen. I mean, I, I don't know what else it is. I, well, I mean, we saw the same thing here in El Salvador. We had this existing community program going on long before Bitcoin was interjected. But it was like Bitcoin was this missing secret sauce that once we started <laughs> using Bitcoin, like all these things that we had hoped to happen before just all of a sudden started happening. And yeah. first I thought it was just a coincidence, but then I realized it was really driving them to just think differently about things. And so and so when I was hearing you explain that you saw the same thing, I was like, yes, I get it. You tell anybody else, they're probably going to say, yeah, no, that's sure. Bitcoin fixes the world. <laughs> but I mean, it really does. Bitcoin does fix this. So it's pretty yeah. phenomenal to kind of see that. Um, I, I cannot wait to meet your coaches. We're hoping to get to South Africa, but um, hopefully next year they can come to the conference here in El Salvador. Um, I think that's a really crucial thing for to get the community leaders to the Bitcoin conferences, help them start meeting other Bitcoiners, developing their own relationships, but also to show Bitcoiners, you know, what is happening on the ground in these places. We were able to take our team to Buenos Aires for the LeBitConf uh, a couple of weeks ago that mm -hmm. you joined us for. And, you know, you saw how fun it was for them to, to be able to go and start meeting all these people. And, um, you know, now they have relationships around the world, ones that will probably last their lifetime. And these people will come visit them. They'll hopefully go visit, you know, visit people in other places, help and start these projects. So that's my goal for you guys is to get your coaches to some of these conferences. Um, maybe for Ghana, if you can get the, if they can get their passports in time. I know that's a <laughs> challenge, but you're, you're going to the Ghana conference yes. right yes yeah. i'm going to the ghana conference i think i think taking any one of those coaches but particularly i would like to maintain the hierarchy and go down the list and start with the most senior guy which is lutando um that that would be an absolutely fantastic experience it would just you know make this whole thing so much more um not that it's not real but it would make it you know more sort of tangible um yeah, that that'll be a fantastic experience. That's also one of my goals for next year is to try and get at least Lutando, maybe even one or two of the junior coaches together with him uh, to one of these conferences. If it's the one in El Salvador, it would be even be even better because here you have a place where you know the same kind of thing is happening. Um, that'll be fantastic to make you know connect those two dots. Well, I, I I really have a feeling you're going to make some great connections there at the conference in Ghana. I know Cash App is sponsoring it, and I love Cash App. They actually just sponsored all of our weekend events here. Um, we had this amazing surf contest today. We're doing a swim event tomorrow. But I know Jack Dorsey has been very focused on Africa and really has a belief that Bitcoin will be able to transform the continent. And I believe he's going to actually be speaking in person this year, yeah. which is funny. He, he wasn't even, uh, you know, I, I don't think he even wanted to speak in person in Miami, but he's wanting to be there on the ground in Ghana. So I think it's going to be an amazing conference and and hoping you guys can make some connections with whether it's cash app or some of the other companies that are focused on africa and find some companies and, and individuals that are really willing to get behind what you guys are doing and help provide the resources you guys need to continue to build this yeah 100 percent. i mean I, I i'm i'm hoping i'm hoping that um that that conference is is a huge success i'm i'm, I'm sure it will be uh you know it seems to be pretty well organized so far there's been a few hiccups but that's to be expected it's the first time they're doing this so you know but once once we're there i'm, I'm pretty sure that everything will will go smoothly um I, there's a great great lineup of speakers i'm really looking forward to to that i'm also quite surprised that jack jack dorsey is going to be speaking there you know he hasn't I don't know if he's been invited to other conferences. Maybe. He oh has. yeah, I think he gets invited to every conference. He must, he must have been invited <laughs> to loads. So it's it's surprising that he hasn't, you know, spoken at one of the bigger ones, but has decided to speak at this one. I obviously can't speak on behalf of Jack Dorsey, but my my feeling is, you know, my feeling, my personal feeling has always been that, you know, there's a lot that Bitcoin can do in Western dev developed countries, but I think the real the real sort of on the ground application lies in these places like El Salvador, you know, like the rest of Central and South America, like Africa, you know, the global South, as it's called, supposedly, you know, the countries that 
have been sort of, you know, not always directly oppressed, but have been pulling at the short end of the stick for for the better part of the last two centuries. Um, that's that's where Bitcoin has a real, you know, sort of liberating power. And I think it's one of the reasons why it was adopted as legal tender in El Salvador, because, um, you know, the, the leaders here realized that, hey, we can actually we can actually put our country in a position of power uh, where before it's always been subjugated to to the power of others. Um, and so I think, you know, that's why I'm really excited about Bitcoin in Africa. It's one of the reasons why, not the only reason, but it's one of the more important reasons why I'm still in South Africa. You know, there's been a huge movement of people, you know, anyone that can afford to is leaving the country in droves. And I'm actually quite positive about the future there because I think it's one of the countries where Bitcoin can do a lot of good and there's going to be a lot of exciting developments happening there, I believe, um, you know, in large part, thanks to this to this tool that we have that we can use, um, you know, to 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 take back some of that some of that freedoms. Yeah, no, South Africa is is a beautiful country and there is so much potential, but there's been so many challenges, you know, along the way. But I think Bitcoin can really help overcome these over time and give people the tools to compete on a level playing field. So, no, I'm definitely bullish on on everything in the developing world. I think that this is the next decades are going to be, you know, a transformational time. Um, I know one thing we've talked about a little is is um, you guys are running a business in South Africa that's involved with surfing. That's kind of how you got involved with the surfer kids aspect. And I would love to be able to support your guys' business there and love what you're doing with Bitcoin Akasi. No, you have to pay your bills like everybody else. So tell us a little bit about the the surfing tour business that you guys run. We're, we're hoping to maybe get some Bitcoin slash surf tours going on down there, but I would love for people to just understand what services you guys offer and Bitcoiners that want to support you and, and do yeah. a trip to South Africa. No, hundred percent. I mean, we've, uh, we've been accepting Bitcoin as payment for our surf trip since 2015. So we're a Bitcoin friendly operation. You can pay for your entire trip in Bitcoin. Um, and we organize seven day, 10 day, 14 day trips. Um, we used to operate in various different areas of South Africa, even in, in neighboring countries like Mozambique. Uh, we haven't been to Mozambique for a while. You know, the whole COVID lockdown situation made that very difficult, but we still operate in South Africa. Um, we do trips between Cape Town and, and, and the garden route. Um, and yeah, we'll take people surfing. Um, there's a lot of beautiful waves. There's a lot of uncrowded spots. South Africa is a beautiful country. Um, you know, we cover transport, uh, we organize accommodation. We've got all the surfing equipment that you, that you could need if you don't want to bring your own. Uh, generally you'd need a wetsuit. The water's not as warm as it is here. Um, so, uh, yeah, boards, wetsuits, transport, travel, accommodation, all those things are covered. Um, and, uh, Oh, we've got the surf coaches and it, it, it ties in with, with, with Bitcoin Ekasi because, you know, basically the business and the nonprofit has been very closely linked since the very beginning. We, we started the two of them together. Um, we started the nonprofit because we wanted to give tourists a different perspective on South Africa. It's so easy to go to South Africa and feel like you are in Europe um, when the reality is obviously that you're not. It's just that those aspects that don't look European are you know, on the other side hidden. of the highway. Yeah, they, they're hidden. Um, and that's because of South Africa's past of racial segregation. So, um, you know, that's one of my aims. And that has always been one of the aims of the business since the beginning is it's not just a surf trip. It's kind of like, you know, you want to see the reality of the country that you go to. You don't just want to be a tourist. You want to be a traveler. Um, so, yeah, but there's lots of uncrowded waves and that's the main reason why people should be interested in coming. It's far to fly, but there's a, there's a reward at the end of that long flight. And that's the fact that not many people actually fly there. <laughs> so how, how can they find you guys? Are you guys on Twitter or website yeah. or what, what's the best way for people to, uh, we're on Twitter. Uh, we've got a website, Unravel Surf what's, Travel. What's the Twitter handle? The Twitter handle is Unravel Surf. Okay. So unravel as in, you know, if you're unraveling the story. Yes, yes. Unravel surf. Okay. Well, I, I hope to be one of your clients, hopefully in the next couple months <laughs> here. Um, we tentatively have a trip planned, uh, my son and I, to go surf 
there yeah. in Mosul Bay. So, um, but I'm sure there's a ton of other Bitcoiners out there that would love to to come, whether they're surfers or not. You know, would love to come see what you guys are doing there. I think you guys do safaris and other stuff too. That the oh, plan there's for loads people, of so. things to do. That's uh, there's lots of stuff to do in South Africa. Obviously, the safari is, you know, always the main attraction. Elephants, lions, giraffes, all that sort of thing. I've spoken to a few surfers here um, at uh, at adopting Bitcoin. And it's, you know, there's been a, a little bit of interest. So hopefully, hopefully we can make that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's thanks to the surfing business that I was introduced to Bitcoin, actually. So the two have been going hand in hand for quite some time. So... Well, it's interesting you were telling me that it was because a lot of your guys' clients are, are Russian. And so that was the easiest way to get money to you guys was to send it as Bitcoin. Um, yeah. And I, I think now it's one of the only ways, right? That's yeah. for Russians, they're all challenged to use any of the, of the traditional banking system. And, you know, people that had nothing to do with the war that's going on and are themselves victims, you know, are, are now locked out of the financial system, which I yeah. think is very unfair. So it's great to see that, that Bitcoin fixes that also. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's actually quite ironic. Um, the first the first payment in Bitcoin that we got for our surf trips was from Ukrainians, <laughs> not from Russians, uh, but they you know, like so many people in that part of the world, they they are Ukrainian, but they've got ties to Russia. I mean, my wife was born in Ukraine. She was raised in Ukraine, but she, you know, they moved to Russia when the Soviet Union collapsed. So there, there's many people in that part of the world that have, you know, they've got ties to both sides. And I think the, the thing is always like so polarized. It's portrayed as being very polarized, but I think a lot of people sympathize with both sides. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it was... A, the first conflict in 2015 already in some instances it was the only way to get money um, from clients and now today in most instances it's the only way to get payments from clients um, fortunately i mean we're already quite comfortable using bitcoin as money um, and uh, i don't know i mean it's great that there is something i mean i'm incredibly grateful I mean, thank you satoshi <laughs> there is a way for us to um for us to to run our business because i mean really like that it's it's got nothing to do with me but it's impacting my life it has been impacting my life for a long time um you know this megalomaniac people who want to ruin the planet dropping bombs all over the place you know i don't support any of that but yet you know you're prevented from you know taking payments from clients as a result of that so it's it's i'm i I'm beyond grateful that there's something out there that allows people to just transfer value between one another and make things happen despite um, some of these larger geopolitical things that that don't really have much to do with people on the ground, you know? Yeah. Um, it's always it's always the normal people that pay the price. Yeah. And the people that are causing the problems, they they have so much money that they can always work around it all. Yeah. And it's, so it's ridiculous. It's It's the people on the ground who pay the price. And most of them... I think many of them don't actually want any of that. They just want to live their lives and be happy and do business and make business and build things. And, you know, so, yeah, I'm incredibly grateful um, to to uh, to Satoshi and every everyone that came before him and everyone that came after him, her or she or they or whatever he was, they were, I don't know, uh, incredibly grateful um, that there is this network um, that exists that allows us to to interact with each other financially um, without having to, you know, yeah, ask for permission and most of the time get told no. <laughs> <laughs> so I know there's going to be an increasing number of Bitcoiners that want to support what you guys are doing there at, at Bitcoin Akasi. Um, and I also know from working on projects that, that funding is often a limiting, you know, a factor in, in what you can achieve. So why don't you let people know how they can donate or where they can donate to Bitcoin Akasi, but also uh, what type of volunteer opportunities or what other things that you guys need. Um, and then, of course, we want everybody to follow you guys on Twitter and just help get the word out about what you guys are doing. So let people know where they can follow you on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, donations is what the nonprofit is based around. Um, I know in the world of Bitcoin, that's sometimes frowned upon. You know, uh, people always want to know how you're going to make this effort sustainable. But um, 
the Surfing Kids has always been a donation-based nonprofit. It's not as if we started Bitcoin Ekasi and all of a sudden started asking for donations. We've been taking fiat donations since we you know, initiated the project. And so we've simply switched over to Bitcoin donations, which actually works a lot better because we don't lose fees to a, you know, a middleman like PayPal. Um, but also people can donate small amounts because of the Lightning Network. You don't have to donate $100 at a time. You can donate one or two. Um, but yeah, it's always been a donation-based nonprofit. Um, you know, you can follow the Surfer Kids or you Let, can follow- I just want to jump in re real quick on what you're saying about donations, because I think it's an important point. As Bitcoiners, we believe government should play less of a role. So it's very important that as private citizens that we step up and pour into these needs because there's definitely lots of needs in the world. And so if we're saying we don't want the government to take care of these, then we should, as Bitcoiners, be the ones that are stepping up. So I'd really like to encourage people to be giving to projects like yours because that is what will make a difference and will help us get government out of these efforts. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think, I think a a, a privately run uh, charitable organization can do things a lot more efficiently. Um, and um, there are some initiatives that that can't be run in a profit making way you you are going to have to rely on donations to do this sort of thing maybe not indefinitely but at least for some time um but yeah we take donations um you know in bitcoin uh through the website which is bitcoinekasi.com um on twitter the twitter handle is at bitcoinekasi and um yeah just quickly i mean the word ekasi is a reference to a township that's a lot of people ask me about that and that's where the name comes from but it's a it's a it's a reference that's that's used by the people who live there themselves very few people outside of the townships use that word and it's a very positive it has a positive connotation so yeah donations in bitcoin are welcome and we use that to run the organization as efficiently as we possibly can and what about visitors? Are visitors welcome to come yeah, check 100%. out what you guys are doing? Hundred percent. I mean, I don't want people to take my word for what's happening there. Um, I would prefer if I'm not the one telling the story. If it's the coaches and the kids doing that, but that's you know oftentimes not possible. Um, but visitors are absolutely welcome. I mean, they don't even have to announce that they're coming. They can just show up. You know, we welcome that. Um, you know, we've got a map. Uh, on the website that shows the location of all the shops. Um, the Surfer Kids are very public in where they are located, when they operate, how they operate. People are more than welcome to come and visit that. Um, obviously, if you want to get involved in a volunteer sense, then it would be necessary to reach out and tell us, you know, listen, I want to do this or that. Uh, in terms of volunteering opportunities, you know, people are welcome to come and help us with, uh, with the surfing uh aspects of the program if they know how to surf obviously we don't want <laughs> we don't want people making the situation dangerous by you know riding over kids and stuff um there's always opportunity for for developers to get involved we don't have any developers on our team i have a lot of help from people remotely but there are some things that need to be done in person um you know we do what we can uh with the skills that we have but it's becoming more and more necessary. I think I, you know, I, I, I think it was Andrew from Galloway who took a little video of me, you know, asking for a developer to pop up out of the ground like a mushroom because it just feels like we need <laughs> that. You know, there's I my my head is bursting with all these technical things and a lot of it goes over the top of my head. Um, you know, it's it's taken me like seven years to understand some of the most basic things about Bitcoin transactions and how they work. So. It's just not my my area of expertise. Um, and so I, I think we could probably do a lot more if we had a developer that was sort of, at least for some time, based where we are and could look at the setup and say, okay, I think you guys should do this or yeah, I think you should do that or let me help you with this. That That's a, a great volunteering opportunity that exists and it would it would really help a lot. I mean, we could, we could help with things like accommodation and so on. Um, you know, just reach out to us and we'll see what we can do. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it. I know uh, you're leaving tomorrow for your 30 hour, 30 plus hour journey back to. Uh, <laughs> it's way more than 30 uh, hours. Yeah, so you, you said you had a, what, a 12 hour layover in, in Argentina. So yeah, um, <laughs> amongst others. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's got a long trip ahead, but I know you'll be back there in Mosul Bay shortly. Um, yeah. 
and uh, be exciting to see all the the things the team did uh, in your absence. And yeah, I'm hoping next time I see you, it's in South Africa. I hope so, so too. Um, I hope so too. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for, for your spirit, your willingness to just kind of serve. And yeah, let's just keep pushing this thing forward. Yeah, hundred percent. And thank you very much for the support from from Bitcoin Beach. We, there's no way we would have been able to do it without you guys. Uh, it, uh, it was amazing when when the, when when yourself and you know and, and it's just reached out to us and 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 trusted us with you know taking this forward. And there was yeah, there was mo there, there were moments in the beginning where I wasn't sure what we were doing was going to work. But uh, once we had that support, you know, first from Bitcoin Beach and then from other people in the Bitcoin space, um, that sort of gave me the the uh, the reassurance that you yeah, know this is something that is necessary in the Bitcoin community. We we have to go ahead and we have to keep on doing this. Thank you. All right, I really appreciate it. Well, let's call it a night. Thank you. <laughs>